วัสดีค่ะ Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and good morning to all those from European. Um, my name is Rose c h i t a n w a t I'm going to be the moderator for today's session. So today, I welcome again for you guys to the ASF Expert Series sponsored by APC. You can see the video already about how interesting of the APC products, innovations, and technologies. And definitely, some of you already joined with us since last year on the APC variety of webinars, which is bringing the innovation, technology, and the solution approach into the market in every uh, type of uh, species of animal production. So today, with me again, I am very um, Please to uh, tell you guys that the session today have a very uh, knowledgeable uh, expertise expert in chairing the session and uh, one of our um, guest speaker very well known in the ASF uh, stories uh, from I if I'm not mistaken I also follow her from OIE. However, let's start from the first session. We are going to be together about one and one hour and thirty minutes. So we are going to start with introduction of uh, who is APC. So I have with me Mr. Ramesh Subramanian. He is the uh, director of sales for Asia Pacific for APC. So he's going to cover a bit on APC and what is the solution provided by APC. Please, Ramesh. Yeah, thank you everyone uh, for joining this webinar. Good afternoon and good morning to everyone. Uh, we had, as Ms. Rose said, uh, we had a very overwhelming uh, uh, response to this webinar. Uh, we have been doing this webinar uh, under the uh, expert series, ASF expert series, and we are trying to bring in uh, global experts on ASF and share the information and the latest developments uh, with the marketplace. Uh, so today we are very happy to bring in Dr. Sandra Bloom, who is head of the German referral laboratory for African swine fever, as well as for the classical swine fever. So uh, we have received a lot of interesting questions, uh, which will be addressed. Uh, at the end of the session, but, um, but which will be very interesting to know some of her views on the topic. But on her presentation, she will speak about how the ASF virus is unique and its transmission pathways, and what is the status of ASF in Europe with some of the recent developments and worldwide, including Asia. Uh, what, what are the risks associated with feed metrics? Uh, Followed that, uh, we have Dr. Javier Polo, who is uh, the Senior Vice President for Research and Development with APC, and uh, uh, he will cover the biosafety of plasma, how plasma is manufactured, what are the different steps to ensure the safety of plasma, and how plasma can be an excellent efficiency tool to improve the immunity and gut health um, of your pig population. So just to start with, uh, I'll take the next few minutes to explain uh, who APC is and our business activities. APC is part of the Lauritsen Group, uh, which is not the LGI Group. Uh, it's a privately held company with headquarter in Iowa in the state of U uh, Iowa State in US. Uh, we have 60 production facilities uh, around the world and 2,400 employees. The focus of uh, the company, uh, the group company, is on value-added protein technology, how the extraction and fractionation of proteins from complex biological fluids and it's scaling up. Um, so uh, the history of the company, uh, the LGI group itself, is over 100 years. Um, it started in 1916. We started off with a dairy creamery business. But currently, if you look at 2020, we are providing value-added products for the food, feed, and human health sector. The Lauritsen Group has seven companies under it. Some of you may know about them, but APC is one of the largest company uh, which is into the feed ingredient business. APC was uh, formed in 1981, which is about 40 years old, and we are currently the world's largest manufacturer of spray-dyed plasma functional proteins. 
with uh, global presence in marketing and sales operations and wide application in different species. Uh, the cornerstone of our success is our commitment to research and innovation. This is our innovation center in the US. We also have an innovation center um, in Spain uh, where Dr. Javier is based in. And we also, uh, we also collaborate with some of the, the world renowned universities for joint applied research. And all these initiatives have resulted in over 600 plus of peer review published journals and articles across different species. This is the product offering that we do. We have plasma, a spray dried plasma, uh, as well as spray dried red cells, or you call it hemoglobin. We provide 100% porcine or 100% bovine, and we also have ultraviolet processed plasma products also. We also have the calf milk replacer product, which is primarily sold in the North American Mexican markets. We also cater to the, uh, to the fruits and vegetable market uh, through our peptone based products, which enhances the root growth and the productivity of the farm crops. In terms of application, if you look at plasma, the biggest application still continues to be in the science sector, in the nursery pigs, and in the transition feeding to, to improve immunity and to reduce stress. Uh, and we will cover some of that today in the presentation. We also have seen an increased acceptance for plasma in the poultry sector where it is given to the chick stage uh, in the first seven days or 10 days to improve immunity. And we are one of the largest supplier of uh, the hemoglobin or red cells into the aquaculture sector, uh, which is uh, the, the red cell is a very good source of highly digestible protein um, in, um, in the aquaculture species. We also cater to the dog food and cat food uh, in, wet, in, the, in, um, in the wet form or in the moist form or semi-moist form. And uh, we also have the food grade meat based stocks and broths and flavor enhancers, which goes into the pet food sector, which is seeing a, a big growth nowadays. And as I mentioned, we have the calf milk rake places and for the agronomy crops. How plasma is made? This is a question that you know, we, we, we get a query often and uh, Dr. Javier will be speaking on it. But what I could say in summary is that we follow the WHO guideline, which is similar to the human blood transfusion, how the blood is handled. We follow the same process in terms of safety standards. We have... Um, a blockchain technology to ensure that we have complete traceability of the product which comes from the factory to your feed mill or to your farm. So to ensure that it's absolutely safe for use. Uh, we are a global business, we have global presence. Uh, I'll run through some of the production facilities. Um, in North America, we have about seven production plants. Uh, most of our supplies into the Asian markets comes from either US or from Canada. And it's, it's predominantly porcine and bovine plasma. We also have production facilities in Europe. Um, we have it's in Spain, in Poland, uh, we have Northern Ireland and in England. Uh, we also get products uh, from the Spain plant into Thailand. And we also have hemoglobin, which is coming into from the Spain market into, um, and also from UK into the Asia Pacific market. We also have production facilities in Brazil and in Argentina, where we also get uh, the bovine-based uh, red cell or hemoglobin into the Asian market. Um, in, the, in the year 2008, uh, there was a survey conducted by the American Society of Animal Science to understand which are the top 10 discoveries in the past 100 years in the swine nutrition. And you'd be pleased to know that in the 100 years, uh, in this ranking of 10, plasma ranked number six, which shows how plasma has stood the test of time in terms of demonstrating benefit uh, to the swine nutrition. APC has 17 production facilities spread across the world. Uh, APC is also the founding member of the North American Spray Dried Blood and Plasma Producers Association in, and is in the working group uh, within the American Feed Industry Association. We have been granted 20 patents in the United States and in Europe 
for the collection, processing, and feeding of blood and plasma proteins. As I mentioned earlier, we also have uh, you know, uh, about 600 over peer reviewed articles on the application of plasma in different species. Uh, we completed 25 years of our presence in Asia Pacific, and we would like to thank all our customers for the support. We are present in all the major production countries. These are our distribution partners. If you want to get in touch with them, or you can get in touch with us. Uh, we also know that we have we have uh, some of the people are from Europe. So if anybody wants to get in touch with us, please feel free, and we will redirect you to the right person in our team. Uh, this is the Asia Pacific team uh, with our own people. And if you want to follow us on any of the social media platforms on LinkedIn, Facebook, and um, on YouTube, this recording of this YouTube will also be available um, on YouTube channels for you to watch later. But hang on, but I think you know you have a, a very interesting sessions coming on and uh, and for the question and answer sessions, you will have a lot of practical insights. I thank you for this opportunity. Over to you, Ms. Rose. I thank you very much, Mr. Ramesh. Uh, once again, very impressive presentation, and I see a lot of expansion during this the, the, the last six months. Congratulations to the APC group. So uh, now we are going to bring you guys into the very interesting uh, session start by our expert. This is a real AX. ASF expert series bringing by APC. So the registrant for the session actually is over 600 and now we are having about 300 over participants in the, in the session. Uh, congratulations to this successful webinar to APC. Right now, I think our expert is ready to uh, give us the presentation on the update on the current ASF situation and transmission pathways through different metrics. Uh, we have together with us here, Dr. Sandra Bloom. She is the head of German National Reference Laboratories for African and Classical Swine Fever. I gonna pass the microphone to Dr. Sandra. And if you have any question, please put in the Q&A box below the screen for Dr. Sandra. Dr. Sandra, over to you. Thank you very much for the nice introduction and the opportunity to be with you today, at least virtually. Actually, the German situation has changed quite dramatically. So that's why I'm quite busy with the diagnostics. And if you have questions, I'm really happy to answer in the Q&A later and also if you type them. Um, today, I would like to update you on the ASF situation, but I will also discuss with you the transmission pathways, uh, especially uh, through different matrices. It's not an easy question, and you know that um, some answers are not as black and white as we would like, but I would like to try and explain as much as I can. We should not forget the causative agent and um, quite a lot that gives us a headache in epidemiology can be explained by the features of the virus. So we are talking about a large and complex DNA virus. I'm often asked why on earth do, don't we have good vaccines? One of the problems is really that this virus is so complex. If you compare, for example, classical swine fever, African swine fever, the one has one so-called open reading, reading frame. This virus has more than 150. So you can see that there's really just a, a high complexity and a lot of the functionality is still unknown. We have another problem. The virus replicates in macrophages. Macrophages are the designated killer cells of the immune system. And if you replicate in these cells, you just avoid the immune system and you replicate at the, uh, in, at the location where you usually are destroyed. And this also gives us um, quite some trouble. The, this virus is really a master of immune modulation and immune evasion. This means it brings along factors that play with your immune system or the immune system of the host. So it, for example, interferes with the interference system or it also um, more or less swaps uh, apoptosis, so the programmed cell does. 
It is also very important to understand that we talk about a virus that is initially an arbovirus. Arbo stands for arthropod borne virus. And uh, if you are transmitted by arthropods in this cycle, you are optimized for blood transmission. Of course, blood transmission from infected animals. The competent vectors I will show you later are soft ticks. And these soft ticks do not play a role in most settings. They are, in the end, part of the sylvatic cycle in Africa. But we have to keep this in mind. The infectivity is thus bound really to blood. And this also um, gives us these discussions on blood products, but it is really a matter how you treat it. And I will come back later how you can inactivate this virus. It is one important thing also that without tick transmission and quite a lot of blood, of, of blood, blood around, the contagiosity is moderate. I don't know if you have experienced it, but it's really the case that if you enter the virus to a farm, the animals that are infected die, but the infection more or less goes slowly through the holding. And it can happen that you have two sick pigs and the whole stable, the, re the remainder of the stable is even negative, not even infected. This is really sometimes giving us trouble when talking about control and also about culling the animals. So this is really something you have to keep in mind. The contiguity is moderate. And something that really gives us problems is the high tenacity and stability of the virus. So the virus is an envelope virus. So disinfection is not really a problem. But whenever you leave it on its own, it is rather uh, stable. And you can have it for very long times in the surroundings and in, in the environment. And this gives also an explanation why if you restock, you sometimes run into trouble again. In the end, it is important to distinguish between the high lethality that is uh, associated with the disease. So animals that are infected, they die. But if we talk about mortality, we talk about the mortality of a population. It can be your stable or it could be the whole um, pig population. Then this is moderate. Because, as I said, an infected animal usually dies, but not all animals have to get infected. And this is sometimes some, something that is very difficult to explain if the ASF strikes in your countries. If we talk about the stability, let's have a look what it means. Usually, what you can say of any virus, viruses do not like to be dried, to be heated, and they don't like detergents if they have an envelope. What the virus likes is moist and cool. So please um, remember everything that you keep in your freezers or you're just cooled can stay infectious for months. Room temperature is something in between. That's a matter of time and the virus tighter. But everything above is inactivating the virus in a time um, and tighter fashion. So the virus can stay active three hours at 50 degrees centigrade. This is rather long, but you see if you, for example, would do 45 degrees centigrade for seven days or something like that, you would inactivate the virus. It can stay infectious in feces. Um, in recent studies, it was roughly 10 days. Even longer is mentioned in old publications. That's why we usually say roughly 90 to 100 days. This gives you also an idea how you con can contaminate grains. If you use uh, slurry or something else, there is a possibility uh, to, to contaminate. Blood, as I said, is in several aspects a problem or can be a problem. If you have an, an infected animal and you keep the blood at room temperature, you are able to regrow the virus, re-isolate the virus for 70 days. When I started with my career, I actually did it and tried if this is really true. Um, the blood does not look very nice anymore. It's blackish and smelly, but um, it is still positive for virus. So virus from an infected animal that is not treated in any uh, aspect is a big problem, even if you dry it on the surface. Then you see that this is um, 15 weeks in cool pork. And please keep in mind, cooling is never a good idea with the virus. 
And then six months in conserved ham. You can ask, why do we know so much about ham? It's pretty easy. Uh, when the virus entered the European um, continent the first time, this was in Portugal and Spain. And what do you, what can you associate with Portugal and Spain, or at least with Spain? Quite a lot of very good ham, and that's why we know so much. As I said, cooling is a problem. 18 months for um, blood cooled in the fridge, and years and decades in frozen carcasses and pork. Please keep in mind that I keep my virus stocks at minus 80 degrees and they are there for decades. So be, be aware. Um, the virus is quite stable at pH uh, between 4 and 11. Of course, there is also a time um, problem, but this also gives you an idea how you can inactivate the virus. Using organic acids, using or even if you just do um, fermentation, there is, in the end, if you drop uh, the pH to a silage uh, pH, then you inactivate the virus. Of course, also in a in a manner that reflects the time and the titer that was in the in the uh, matrix. You also have to keep in mind that proteins can stabilize the virus. Uh, this shows you here these twenty one hours at uh, thirteen uh, pH thirteen. In the end. Um, this is true for all viruses. This is nothing, nothing special, but you have to, this is why if you talk about disinfection, we are talking about cleaning and disinfection. All the inactivation procedures are best when you clean first. That's the usual procedure. Uh, if you talk about disinfection, this virus is not so much a problem. It's, you can use commercial disinfectants for envelope viruses. It can contain parasitic assay, formic um, acid, hypochlorite is also very active, but also iodine and quaternary ammonium compounds. It depends on what is available in your country. Uh, in Germany, where we, we were discussing, not only in Germany, but now we are discussing it, uh, how to treat um, the, the soil underneath the carcass. And there was quite a lot of discussion about lime slurry or caustic lime. We have recently shown that it works, um, but you have to keep in mind that caustic lime can also cause devastating uh, yeah, fires. So be careful. Anyway, treatment, heat treatment is always a good idea. Uh, in my lab, we, uh, we have a scale of temperatures and time, uh, 70 degrees for 20 minutes or 60 degrees or 30 minutes will definitely inactivate the virus. We use 56 uh, degrees centigrade for two hours to get rid of residual virus in, for example, zero. This shows you in the end that any combination of drying, heating, and probably um, lowering the pH can give us a good opportunity to inactivate the virus. Let's go back to the disease for a short, for, for a short um, glance. Uh, we are in a quite lucky position because this virus is really dangerous and we are now encounter um, yeah, more or less a pandemic, but the virus has no zoonotic potential whatsoever. You have read in funny newspapers, the virus has no potential. I have worked with African swine fever diseased animals without any protection for more than a decade now, and I do not even have antibodies. So please do not listen to this um, rumors. The hosts are only suits, pigs. The problems arise from domestic pigs and in, in our hands in Eurasian white boar. And we have the other hosts that are in black. They are the ones that probably do not show really clinical signs are African white suets and soft ticks of the genus Ornithodorus. I put here a circle because they are the partners in the so-called Slovatic cycle. I will come back to it um, in a second. So these are the ones that, um, yeah, in, in the end concern us. And then the, the ones in Africa are important because they do not get sick. And it's interesting to understand why on earth don't they get sick. How does the um, disease look like? I have received already some questions if there could be some kind of subclinical infection. Yes, there is um, a wide variety of um, clinical signs. It depends on the violence of the strain. The ones circulating at the moment are almost exclusively highly violent. 
you have read a bit about the, um, the China situation, I will come back to it, but the most of the strains are highly violent. And then you see first signs appearing roughly four days post-infection. And the name is a program, it's African Swine Fever. And so the cardinal symptom is really high fever and everything that you can relate to the high fever. Reluctance to move, inappetence, the animals huddle, you see them here. Um, but it is important to remember that not necessarily all pigs in a pen or in a stable unit have to get sick at the same time. Some animals also develop conjunctivitis and gastrointestinal signs, means vomiting and diarrhea. And with the progression of the disease, um, the animals can become somnolent. They appear a bit disorientated and show dyspnea. This comes from a severe lung edema. And in the final phase, affected animals may show seizures that you see here on the upper, upper right, or hemorrhages like epistaxis, but also bleedings from the anus or these um, bleedings in the skin. So African swine fever is a good example for a viral hemorrhagic fever. But um, in the beginning, the clinical signs are very unspecific. So please... Um, exclude the disease as much as possible. Also, if you are not sure, it is important to do early detection because we don't have treatment and we so far don't really have licensed vaccines, at least in most of our countries. Talking about wild boar, it's at the moment really a problem in Europe. It may not be a problem in your countries, but um, in general, the wild boar show almost similar signs to domestic pigs. They are not like African white suits. They do get sick, they do die from the, from the disease. And under fear conditions, it's often the disorientation and the lack of fear towards humans and dogs that um, shows us that there's something wrong. And we often see just the carcasses. So carcasses and diseased animals are quite often found in moist areas of their habitat. So small water bodies, um, areas where they usually uh, go for scrubbing and so on. So in the end, um, they show almost the same. So how does the current situation look like at the moment? This is the European perspective. Of course, this is my perspective. And um, you see here the blue dots, that's the wild boar. And you see the red dots, that's the domestic pigs. And to cut a long story short, it's really the case that in most of the European Union member states, the white boar are at the moment the driving force, and that's where the, the virus replicates. It found a rather good breeding ground, apparently. And <clears throat> only in some countries, we have a true problem in domestic pigs. You see here in Romania, that's down here. There we have um, almost the same number of red dots as blue or even more. In all other countries, you see that you once in a while have red dots, but the, the white boar is the most important problem. In this case, the biosecurity is the most important thing to keep your domestic pigs healthy. But we also see that, especially in summertime, you see here around the, this Germany, I am located here. So that's where the border is. And you see these red dots. We could not really... Um, keep the virus out. It's always human failure if you cannot keep it out, but humans are humans, and that's why it's, it's very difficult. That's the German situation because I just wanted to bring my perspective. We had quite a lot of cases in wild boar, and we had only three outbreaks in domestic pigs, two in very small holdings, and one in a larger uh, farm. But here, and that's why I brought it, we could not really establish the source of infection. And it was discussed again if matrices could have um, been the source. Then African swine fever in Africa, I don't have to carry out to Athens. But in the end, <clears throat> the virus was entered in 2018 and really swept through the continent. Coming from China, it reached almost uh, all countries. So at the moment... If you look at the map, China, Vietnam, Cambodia, Mongolia, North Korea, Laos, Myanmar, the Philippines, South Korea, East Timor, Indonesia, and Papua, Papua New Guinea are affected. And you know of the outbreaks also in India. So um, this is a true pandemic. 
and it gives us or the opportunity, but also the duty to work together to combat this disease. We should also not forget Africa. In Africa, the African swine fever is at the moment also at the rise. There is uh, something going on. Um, the virus seems to be very healthy. We heard from China recently that there were mutants and that there were um, strains of lower violence. There are probably two reasons for that. In the end, we, it is quite clear that there has been the use of illegal uh, vaccines. They carry mutations that are found in deletion mutants used for vaccines, like in the data MGF or CD2V, but um, there are also some natural variants. However, this gives us really um, a headache. It seems that in the end, this, the science get more PRS-like. And um, in the end, you see it is still more difficult to detect, but it's still spreading. So in the end, um, I really advise you not to use vaccines that are not solely tested. I will come back to vaccines a bit later. Um, I'm really a strong um, defender of vaccines, but you have to be sure that you can release them into the open without getting more trouble than you already have. <clears throat> this is um, the most recent development. F the African swine fever has now reached the Americas. After 40 years of peace, the virus was re-entered in the Dominican Republic. And it's now in mo even more than 11 provinces on the island. And it is really something very sad because first it's on the doorstep of the other American countries, but it also hits a poor country with where the, where the pig, pigs are also part of the um, livelihood. Of course, always um, again, behind the, um, some sad stories, also some funny things, not too funny. I don't know if you know them. They are the swimming pigs on the Bahamas. If you have too much money, you go there and take some pictures with these pigs swimming in the, in the sea. Dominican Republic and bah the Bahamas are not too far away, and they are now frightened to introduce the virus also through this tourist attraction. Of course, this was now more ironic, but it is really a problem, and also these pigs we should protect. African swine fever had impact on several um, industries, including ones that you would not have thought of. Um, in the end, this is a German newspaper. This is yeah, a newspaper that has not a very good reputation. It's uh, more or less um, titled that African swine fever is driving the, the prices for wine gums, so for confectionery. It was true because um, at a certain point, gelatin was um, not really on the market anymore. If you have to cull or if animals die in a large fashion, the gelatin gets uh, scarce. The same was actually true for um, the global supply of heparin. So there were really shock waves in some areas that you did not expect. This is the story of vaccines. Today, I'm not talking about vaccines. That's why I only touch it. I'm open for discussion later on. Uh, to be honest, the, there are um, well-characterized vaccine candidates. I would call them candidates that show under experimental conditions that they can give protection um, in almost 100% of cases. But um, given the history, we are very careful um, to call them a vaccine without very thorough um, safety testing. In the 1960s, they already um, used life attenuated vaccines in Portugal and Spain, and this was a catastrophe. It turned out that the vaccines had side effects, long-term side effects in the uh, vaccinated animals, and the um, transmission was almost the same. They, the, the viruses kept um, circulating under the blanket of vaccination, and, and you ended up with much more trouble than you had before. It was stopped, and um, thereafter, 
they had to deal with a very difficult situation. So it is very important to first look into the genetic stability, into the safety aspects that is not so easily um, yeah, mirrored under the experimental conditions. And we should not just use a vaccine, especially a live vaccine in the field. At the moment, only the live attenuated vaccines really gave pr very promising results. Others would be much safer, like subunit vaccines or vector vaccines, but these so far did not really show um, full protection. And I definitely think that we need more data. You know that Vietnam is currently testing a vaccine. On the Philippines, there are um, approaches. There are also in our lab, we are doing trials. There, there are candidates that hold promise, but please uh, don't be hasty because um, then we have more trouble than before. Now let's really go into what we wanted to talk about, uh, the transmission. How, do, how does this stupid virus get into our holdings and also the, the wild boar population? I just briefly want to mention the, the cycle in Africa. I told you this is called Cervatic Cycle. So it's between the Warthog and the um, Onothodorus Mobata um, soft tick. And a competent vector is always characterized through um, really replication of the virus inside the, the vector. So there is transstadial and transovarial transmission and replication. So the, the tick holds the virus and could also, even if the other host is not entered, it survives and will replicate the virus. If you re-enter the host, you, you are in the cycle again. Young warthogs are usually infected in the burrow. They do show um, the viremia that is high enough to transmit the virus. And um, the interesting thing about the warthogs is that they do not get uh, sick. So um, they do show a certain level of viremia, and uh, the older ones are probably um, persistently infected, or at least for a longer time. But um, they do not die, and they do not show symptoms. So for us, the most important thing is what does the immune system do to really control the infection? So far, we were not completely successful. Um, several genetic factors and even the microbiome have been discussed, but um, at the moment, I cannot give you the answer. So whenever the virus is entered into the domestic pig population, the pattern changes. First, it is not any more reliant on the vector, so it can be transmitted without vectors. And here, it really causes severe disease, even death, usually death. Um, in the domestic pig population, the virus can be transmitted as almost all transmissible diseases by direct contact and indirect contact, but also swill feeding, to a certain extent, feed, roughage, and bedding. I will come back to that. And of course, if you think about the what I said with the, with the blood, um, yatrogen, so with the veterinarian, is very easy. If you take one syringe and one needle to vaccinate, and the first animal was infected, you make sure that you bring the virus to, to quite a lot of other animals. In the European Union and beyond, the, um, the wild boar are affected. And there's, of course, a cycle from the domestic pigs to the wild boar and back. Um, the wild boar in themselves, um, there are, of course, the carcasses that stay in the, in the habitat, but also their uh, direct and indirect transmission take place. But swill feeding really is a problem and also the direct contact in certain areas, also just indirect contact. Keep in mind this high stability, even boots and so on can, can transmit the virus. So what do we know about the risk of different matrices? So feed, bedding and so on. It is, as I've uh, said before, not so easy. It's in the end something where we have to weigh and where the risk comes from the repetition and also from the high amounts that we use. Oral infection is actually not so easy. If you compare the parenteral route, so just giving it intramuscular to the oral, you need uh, 10,000 times or more, more virus to get this virus going orally. 
in an old publication, it says you need 140,000 times more. So oral infection is not easy, but it can work. And it can even work with very low doses. This was shown by colleagues from the, from the US, but also in our hands. Usually you need more, but to a certain extent it can work. And if it works once, you have a problem. We do observe a summer peak in several countries that coincide with harvest and sometimes feeding of freshly cut grass. So it was I always discussed if there is um, this connection. How could you contaminate um, the grains and also the, the, the grass? Of course, if you use attention, intentionally or unintentionally slurry from affected holdings, that's one point. Of course, if you dispose of um, carcasses or if white box carcasses are around you, um, this can contaminate feed ingredients at the point of origin. The German situation was actually an example of that. The, the holding in question or the holdings in question were all located in areas where white box carcasses were found in high numbers. And of course, also recontamination is possible. So even if you have a safe product, you can recontaminate it if you are unlucky or stupid enough. As I already said, the virus does not like um, drying acidic acid and pH uh, and, the, and the heat. You can think of inactivation procedures. So what did we look at? I'm now going to something that we did um, at EFSA. EFSA is the risk assessment organization at European Union level. And um, Javier and also myself, we were part of um, a so-called ICI, uh, expert knowledge el elicitation, um, leading to an opinion on the matrices. And we actually went into animal byproducts, so hydrolyzed proteins, pig blood products, different feed materials, compound feed, and also bedding. And to cut it short first, it, of course, there was a lot of um, insecurity. So we were often quite unsure of the true risk. I will go with you through what we knew and what we expected. But as I said, black and white is difficult with ASF. So let's have a look at animal byproducts. And there we'll go short because Javier is talking about it. It is um, at the European Union level. It, has, it is very clear and also in many other countries that this production follows standard processing methods for the category, uh, category three animal byproducts. So in the end, it is quite reasonable to think that uh, most of the um, processing methods will inactivate the virus. If we go to hydrolyzed proteins, we did not have any literature on ASF survival, but we know that heat treatment and drying takes place. So in the end, this is not something we think is of high risk. Again, some recontamination and so on can take place, but this is a safe product. Then the pig um, blood products, uh, including the spray dyed plasma, um, I would briefly touch because you will hear about it. But here we do have literature. We do have um, studies in peer-reviewed journals that show that um, in spray dried, uh, the spray drying process will inactivate the virus and is in, in the end yeah, acting as a disinfectant. Then you will always ask about a bigger than four lock reduction. Also, feeding of plasma mixed with low dose ASFV did not result in transmission. So that's also the case. And we recently showed that even if you recontaminate the, the plasma and you store it at room temperature for two weeks, the virus is also completely gone. So again, this is always, yeah, the heat, um, proper treatment. And if you, of course, um, look at the production, they will use healthy animals. They will not use the, the sick ones. Then rendered fat, there's definitely no uh, literature, but um, the process, the the, the processing it has inactivating um, procedures. The same is true for gelatin, um, calcium phosphate. There's also no literature, but the heat and the pH changes, changes involved um, will definitely inactivate the virus. Now then the collagen is quite the same. So um, all in all, animal byproducts could be a risk because 
as I said, blood is definitely a problem, but we do have literature that shows that the procedures inactivated the virus. And if you follow the standard processing steps that are mandatory in the countries with industrialized production, I do not really see a problem. Then we go to feed materials. There we were also a bit at a loss because there is not too much um, published, but we know, for example, for cereal gra grains, that um, contaminated distillers grains stored at variant temperatures uh, were negative after one month, so 30 days. We also showed in my laboratory that two hours drying at a room temperature also inactivated the um, ASF on a variety of grains. So in the end, whenever it is dry and stored, it is probably safe. But of course you can think of recontamination and cereals are a problem because we use so much and we use it repeatedly. And um, in the end, if we look how the batches are created, you mix quite a lot of different origins. And there, if you ask me, is this a high risk? I would say no. If you ask me, can you exclude the risk? I also say no. That's why all these things are still on our um, portfolio on the on the list when we talk about epidemiology. The same is actually true for most of the oil seeds and legume seeds. But we also know that if you recontaminate soy oil cake or soy uh, bean meal, it stays quite um, positive for quite a long time here after 30 days, but others showed not 40 days, so something in between. I told you before that proteins will um, in the end save the virus, and this shows here. Uh, for tubers roots and other seeds and uh, fruits that could be fed to pigs, we have no data. It always depends on the situation in the field. If you have, for example, a lot of carcasses on your on your ground, uh, tubers are washed and so on. You have to see how risk assessment is done. But again, um, storage will definitely do risk mitigation. The same is true for forage and roughage, where I already went into the silage. If the pH is low enough, so roughly four, um, I'm quite sure it is safe. But if you keep it outdoors and the wild boar are dying on your silage, it would change the picture, of course, again. So um, it is a, probably a low risk, but not non-existent. The problem with compound feed was that in the end, we are quite sure that most of the production processes will lead to risk mitigation and inactivation. But you bring together um, materials from different sources and origins, and you also use it at high levels. Um, a study showed also that um, more than 30 days recontamination could be positive. So it is really a matter how you could, could do that. If you keep it at room temperature, it will definitely be inactivated, but in a timely manner. And the feed additives is quite the same. There are some that are more um, yeah, preserving the virus than others. But yeah, and the storage will always help. There is actually no um, data in literature on the bedding materials themselves. Turf and peat have a high, uh, low pH. It could be inactivating, but we don't have hard data. So how did the expert judge it? I don't want you to go into the details, but you see what well, almost what I said. In the end, um, we will always ask um, how many out of 100,000. So it's my, quite a lot. So all these figures are still very low, but it shows you that we were not sure that it would not happen. So it will happen to a certain or at, at a certain level, but, but low. And you also see here that the blood products and hydrolyzed proteins were, went much better than the cereals because of the production process and the, um, in the end, the control and quality. So in the end, you see here it's low, but non-existence non would also be, not be true. This was at the point of origin. Um, and this is, if we think that this is still infectious and there the things get more together, we are quite sure it's a low risk, but we also think that there can be a risk under certain uh, conditions. 
I just wanted to take you very briefly to a couple of our studies. Um, when we do it under experimental conditions, we do it on primary cells. And I will cut it very short because the time is running. Drying always did the trick in our hands. So if you have field crops, um, you really store them before you feed it, um, it inactivated the virus. Also, even if you take the nice sprayed out plasma, you heavily recontaminate it and you keep it at room temperature for two weeks, um, it's a safe product again. So you have always to think about contamination at the point of origin and during the process, and then about recontamination later on. Whatsoever, if you have dry um, conditions at room temperature, it's a matter of time. The same here with the, and one thing that I wanted to show you is, please remember that PCR positive results do not mean infectivity. So whenever I, for example, I contaminate the spray dye plasma, I keep it at room temperature for 14 days. There is no um, reduction in, in the viral genome load, but there is definitely complete inactivation if I take a virus isolation. So if you see a, a PCR result, the PCR result sh shows you that there was virus, but it does not show you that there still is infectious virus. So please uh, tell that apart. It's the same, we did blind passages and even there we couldn't show, we could only show it at, at very low temperatures in the, in the room temperature group. You see here 14 days was inactivation, full inactivation. So that's how, how we did it. And so um, whenever we have to conclude is keep it dry, keep it rather hot, and then we are on the safer side. To come to conclusion and some recommendations, um, why do we still see these epidemiological links? The problem is risk increases with repetition. Feed that is traded in high consignment numbers ranks higher. It's um, sometimes yeah, a bit contradictory because they, the, the product itself seems safe, but if you do it a million times, yeah, there is still a risk. And, and this was also the reason why taking into account the number of consignments, the compound feed and the feed additive ranked higher, uh, also with cereals and straw than, than others. And the, the main problem is the combination of several products with their own risks. This increases the likelihood of contamination. And it is important that actually the hydrolyzed proteins and blood products, please remember coming from healthy animals and being treated in a controlled way, ranked low. And in the end, there was rather a low risk of bedding and enrichment materials um, causing, causing infection. This means low risk, this means not no risk. And as I said, the storage will definitely decrease the um, risk of transmission. So I would have liked to give you a much more black and white picture, but as always in life, the life is gray and we have to try and cut most of the risks and then hope to be safe. That's actually my team that did most of the experimental work I'm part of this Global African Swine Fever Research Alliance. If you work at an institution that is interested, please contact us. And otherwise, I thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Sandra. It's very interesting to see that the, the pork meat in the fridge can stay, uh, the, the frozen one can stay for years. That could be a good answer for some country that import um, pork meat products in Forsen and still have ASF um, in the country. So I will back to that session on the Q&A to you. So a lot of questions on the vaccine coming in as well. I will go to that. Dr. Sandra, can you stay with me a bit with the poll? I'm going to uh, get the audience to participate in one of the questions to, to uh, see how's the effect of the, uh, okay, the question, please, our, the audience, you can join that, what is not the clinical signs of ASF? What is not, okay? So I uh, get Dr. Sandra with me to uh, give the answer. 
All right, I give you another five seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. All right, Dr. Sandra, the answer for this is? Yeah, so the only one that is not really a symptom is the enteritis, and it was answers, answered right. It's actually, wow. the question is a bit weird because, of course, if you look into the, into the gut and you have diarrhea, there is enteritis, but it's not coming from the ASF. It's usually call, coming from secondary infections. All right. All right. Thank you, Dr. Sandra. So now um, I will get Dr. Sandra to take a little break before coming back to the Q&A. Thank you for participation in the uh, question. So the next speaker, he is our um senior vice president of the research and development of APC. He's well known among us on the many research at APC. Today, the topic Dr. Javier Polo going to cover will be on the biosafety of the plasma and dietary strategies to maximize efficiency of pig production. So Dr. Javier with me now, I will pass the video to Dr. Javier to cover the biosafety with us another 40 minutes, please, Dr. Javier. Thank you. Thank you, Ross, for your introduction. Let me know if you can see my, my screen. Yes, sir, I can see very well. Perfect. Well, good afternoon and uh, good morning to all the participants. I want to thank all of you for taking your time to participate in this webinar. And today I'm going to talk about the biosafety of plasma and the dietary strategies to maximize the efficiency of the big production. Starting with the, oh, sorry. Starting with the biosafety of spider plasma, uh, Sandra already told about the risk assessment conducted by the uh, EFSA, by the European Food Safety Agency for the different matrices. But here in my presentation, I'm going to talk about the specific biosafety that we are uh, using for the manufacturing process of spider plasma. Because in the feed industry, there is no guidelines for viral inactivation. There is no guidelines that can be used or published guideline for feed ingredients. In APC, we are following the guidelines from the World Health Organization on viral inactivation and removal procedures uh, uh, intended to assure the viral safety of human blood plasma product. In other words, we are following, we are trying to follow in the guideline for human plasma uh, transfusion. This guideline uh, has been published in 2004 and is available. This guideline say that the viral safety, remember that this is for human uh, plasma product, the viral safety is derived from three complementary approaches during the manufacture, the donor selection, the testing of donation and plasma pools, and viral inactivation and removal procedure in the source of manufacture. Related with the donor selection, uh, how APC is selecting the, the donation, basically we are collecting blood from healthy animals. We collect the blood, from, <clears throat> from inspected abattoir under the competence veterinary authorities uh, control. And uh, we are sourcing from animals that have been in inspected and past fit for slaughter for human consumption. In other words, we are collecting the blood from the same animals that we are eating, okay? This means that we are not collecting blood from clinical sick animals, and we are not collecting blood from animals from regions or area where the OAE list disease has been reported. Obviously, this reduces significantly any risk that we have, not only for African swine fever, for any virus okay, of concern to the industry, because the source of animals are healthy animals. Testing the donation. This is the second um, approach from the World Health Organization guideline. And in our case, uh, we are providing a certificate of analysis uh, for every single lot that we are manufacturing. And for example, with the use of the technique of the PCR, we can uh, we can uh, we can uh, confirm that we are selling bovine plasma free of porcine material or just the opposite uh, weight porcine plasma free of bovine material. But also additional testing can be used for other pathogens. For example, we can analyze that is PDB free or any specific virus. For African swine fever, I want to say that in 
countries that are free of African swine fever, it's not possible to do African swine fever testing because the, uh, this testing can be only done in, uh, in reference lab, in official lab, and if the country is free of, uh, of African swine fever, usually the governments don't allow to, to do this kind of analysis to private companies. And the third approach, if you remember, was procedures to inactivate or remove virus. According with the uh, World Health Organization definition, they define what is a robust processing step. And this is a robust, effective, and reliable process step that will be able to remove or inactivate substantial amount of virus, typically four logs or more. Reducing four logs means to reduce the, uh, the, the probability of, of infection by 99.99%, okay? This means it's a significant reduction just for logs. And according with this uh, guideline, a provision pro process should include one robust processing step in case that we are talking about non-enveloped virus, like porcine parvovirus or porcine circovirus, because these are very heat resistant virus. And then the, 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 the guidelines say that if your process contains one a step able to inactivate four logs of non-enveloped virus is enough. Or in the case of enveloped virus, the production process will include at least two robust uh, processing steps. And the, the, the reason for that is enveloped virus usually are more easy to, to inactivate than non-enveloped virus in general. Eh? There can be some specific for a specific virus, but in general, enveloped virus are easy to inactivate. And then the guideline is recommended to have to manufacturing uh, two process to safety step in your process. Well, what is the safety step that we have in, in APC in our manufacturing process? I'm going to explain the three uh, steps that we have today. And also later on, I, I, will, I want to introduce a new uh, redundant safety step that we, are, uh, that we are moving ahead to apply it in, the, in our manufacturing process. The three ones that we have in all the manufacturing plants are the neutralizing antibodies, the spray drying, and the post drying heat treatment. The neutralizing antibodies, and this has been recognized for human plasma transfusion product, and is the capacity of, of the neutralizing antibodies normally present in the in plasma to neutralize the virus. I recognize that this is virus specific. For example, this is only for virus that are producing neutralizing antibodies in the, in, in the animal. Uh, this can be the case of porcine parvovirus, porcine circovirus, but it's not the case for African swine fever because, as you know, African swine fever is not producing neutralizing antibodies. And we have demonstrated this, uh, this safety step in the case of porcine circovirus. There was a publication that we made in Journal of Animal Science in, in 2013 that we were able to, to demonstrate that the liquid plasma was able to inactivate more than four logs for um, for um, porcine circovirus. What about the spray drying process? We are working with the spray drying process, but in a very specific condition. Then this means 80 degrees throughout the substance. And the question is why 80 degrees throughout if substance? This is coming from the European Directive 2002-99 from the European Commission. And in this directive, there is treatments, they, they enumerate different treatments that eliminate certain animal health risks to meat and milk. This is for human consumption. This is not for animal consumption. And one of the treatments, the treatment number C, is the treatment of 80 degree throughout the substance. And this is for the meat, okay? And they validate that this treatment of 80 degree to deep substance is recognized in activation step for different virus, for food and mouth disease, for classical swine fever, for swine vesicular disease, for, and for African swine fever. This means this is a recognized treatment to inactivate African swine fever, for example, but also classical swine fever. These are the different publications that we have, all these publications in a peer review journals about the spray drying inactivation studies. We have conducted the stu studies with peers, we inactivate four logs. With PDB, two studies, we inactivate more than five logs, more than 3.56. This was the maximum amount of, vi of virus that we were able to, to put in the liquid plasma. Uh, and this was the inactivation. In, by fact, in fact, this study was conducted by the Iowa State University and we were not 
participate in this study. Classical soil fever, we have a new publication this year that we demonstrate on the spray drain process inactivate uh, 5.8 logs for Oyeski disease. For African swine fever, this year we made a peer review publication that demonstrated that we were able to inactivate 4.1 logs. This means that we reduced the infectivity by 99.99%. All of these are envelope virus, but for swine vesicular disease, that is a non envelope virus, we have a publication that demonstrated that we were able to inactivate six logs. Then all this data suggests that the spray dry process is a very safe treatment to inactivate a variety of values of interest for the swine industry. And also demonstrate that this can be considered a robust safety step. What is the last step that we have in our process? The storage, the post drying heat treatment and extended holding period at 20 degrees for 14 days. This is mandatory in all APC manufacturing plants, but also this is mandatory in the EAPA. The EAPA is the European uh, plasma producer association, all the members uh, have uh, this treatment as a mandatory treatment is to keep the product 14 days at 20 degree. Why this? Sorry. Uh, why this? Because the PDB, we demonstrate uh, this was our publication in 2004 and in 2014 that, for example, for PDB, uh, just one week was able to inactivate PDB. And one week was the first day that they analyzed after the initial contamination, probably was even faster than seven days, okay? But also as Dr. Uh, Dr. Sandra Bloom demonstrated, 20 degrees for 14 days was able to inactivate a very high level of, of African swine fever virus, recontaminating spray dry plasma, okay? This means it's a safety step in the manufacturing process of plasma. As I mentioned before, the spray drying is one of the key uh, treatments in one of the key safety steps in our process. And then uh, this process, this step is very close monitor. The operator ensure the only air temperature is maintained on dryers. In fact, this is automatic. The dryer cannot work this day if the spray dry not achieved the 80 degree to the system. And there is a continuous monitoring in the standard procedure. Okay. As I mentioned before, the point of view of, of APC is to have multiple hurdles step strategy. And this concept uh, involves the introduction of mul in multiple, on multiple occasions fundamental level procedures that are used sequential, sequentially and uh, as the most effective way to reduce to eliminate pathogens compared with the sum of individual obstacles. This means that we have different safety steps during the manufacturing process and all together the combination of these steps is what made the product very, very, very safe. This concept of the multiple hardless step strategy is not from us. And this was for the uh, food industry and was introduced in the year 2000. For example, as the rest of the industry, we continue increasing the biosecurity. In the production plants, just to minimize any risk of cross contamination, there is a complete separation of the loading and unloading areas. There is a complete separation inside the plant between the wet and dry area. The workers that are working in the wet area are not able to go to the dry area. They have a special changing room. They have a special uh, canteen. The same for the dry the, for the workers that are working in the dry area. We are trying to minimize, to increase all the biosecurity around the, man, uh, the manufacturing plants. But also in the management of the distributor warehouse, we are involved on that. We are trying to avoid any, uh, to, to increase all the biosecurity at the distributor warehouse. And this is the new redundant step that we are working now. Uh, in fact, we have two uh, commercial facilities both located in the United States, one for porcine plasma and another for bovine plasma. And I'm very proud to say that in the incoming month, we are going to increase the number of commercial facilities and probably by 
by this time next year, probably we, we can have seven or 10 facility with the UV system. Why the UV light? Why this treatment? Okay, it's just to add a redundant safety step, okay? The UV radiation uh, have a mode of action completely different than the spray drying. The spray drying is because the heat treatment and the UV radiation is target the nucleic acid and is able to inactivate a wide variety of bacteria and virus, eh? irrespective of the nature if they are enveloped or non-enveloped virus, okay? Come on. We have uh, a lot of publication in the last two or three years that demonstrate that the UV treatment is a very safety step and can be considered a robust safety step like spray drying process according with the World Health Organization. As you can see here, for most of the, for most of the virus, we have more than four logs. In some cases, we put more than 3.2, for example, in the case of bovine viral diarrhea, but this was the maximum amount of virus that we were able to inoculate in the liquid plasma. And as you can see here, for example, for porcine circovirus, we are able to inactivate more than four logs. For classical swine fever, more than four logs. For African swine fever, more than 4.5 logs. And even for porcine parvovirus, probably one of the most uh, heat-resistant virus, we were able to inactivate more than four logs. This means this step working with envelope and non-envelope virus with different nucleic acid, with different virus sites, very consistent. Uh, uh, safety step. Then, if you put together the spray drying process, the UV, and the storage at 20 degrees for 14 days, as you can see here, the theoretical combined inactivation is more than 10 logs. More than 10 logs, obviously, is, uh, uh, is to reduce the risk by 0 0.000010. One. Is, uh, I'm not aware of any ingredients that the theoretical combi uh, combi uh, combined inactivation is more than 10 logs. And in our case, we are going to, to have this kind of product. This product will be safer, is, well, will be no, is safer than anything that I know. Also the traceability of the final product. Uh, if you have the batch number uh, of, of the bag, we are able to, to have the history of the product. We know the manufacturing date. We know the processing record. What is the spray drying temperature? What is the heat treatment after processing the storage temperature and time of this specific lot? We have the complete traceability for every single lot that we are making. Then a summary, uh, in APC has a continuous program to improvement and the innovative research to ensure the safety and quality of spray dry plasma. The plasma uh, produced in APC can be 100% porcine or 100% bovine. And we are focused in the collection and the processing method that ensure that each batch uh, that we produce and sold is consistently a functional, safe, and effective product for use in animal feed. Okay. Then now we are moving to the second part of my presentation is why to use plasma? Why? Uh, is interesting for you to use plasma. Basically, it's because it's a tool to improve the peak production efficiency. You will see. First of all, in, in APC, we differentiate between protein and functional proteins. Protein is a source of, of amino acid for the animals to build their own proteins. But functional, prote functional proteins are proteins that have an uh, uh, effect beyond the nutritional uh, characteristic of the, of the protein. Okay, and when you are thinking about plasma, plasma is different than most of the protein because plasma is not just one protein like hemoglobin or like other. Plasma is a very mm, complex mixture of functional bioactive proteins like albumin, immunoglobulins, transferrin. We are talking also bioactive peptides. We are talking about growth factors, cytokines, enzymes, hormones, and other components. Plasma is a very complex mixture of different com uh, compounds. There are a lot of publications that demonstrate that the use of plasma improves the health uh, status of the, of the animals, and there is a better survival of the animals when they are fed with uh, plasma protein. Then uh, you will see that plasma uh, maintains the efficient immune response that supports the animal health. 
this is a very schematic uh, to to tell about what plasma can do for you far okay basically is plasma reduce the overstimulation of the immune system if the common immune uh, system response does not return to normal normal quickly uh, to the normal status quickly too many nutrients that uh, are used in the in the diets are used to support the immune response instead of being used for growth okay uh, the immune system activation is one of the of the systems in the body that uh, that is consuming more energy because if the immune system stayed activated for uh, too long produce inflammation which can damage uh, body tissues and the damage intestinal uh, tissues basically have a poor digestion and poor absorption of nutrients then what plasma is doing is made the immune system to act very fast but come back to the normal period uh, also very quickly then there is not over stimulation of the immune system and the energy from the diet can be used for growth there is a lot of publication as uh, rames mentioned in the uh, at the beginning uh, about the use of plasma typically the use of plasma is in creep feeding and at winning for at least two weeks after winning there is more than 30 years publication and basically the data from the publication suggests that feeding plasma improved the average daily gain by 31 percent Part of this is because the animals start eating uh, very fast at winning, and this is really, really, really important. The animals start, need to start eating very fast at winning. The feed conversions uh, also improve by four percent. This was a study that we 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 did not participate in this study. This was a, a study conducted in Thailand, was published in 2015. And, and they were uh, feeding plasma in the creep feeding. Uh, they were uh, feeding plasma at different inclusion levels, 0, 2, 4, and 6 percent from day 7 to day 31 of age. And they win the animals at 24 days. This means it was plasma in the creep feeding from, from 7 to 24 days before winning. And as you can see here, the level of plasma is important. If you are using too low, there is no effect on the body weight, but if you use four percent or six percent, uh, you can see that uh, there was an improvement in the body weight of pigs. So basically, there was uh, almost 500 grams, half a kilo uh, heavier pigs at uh, 31 days of age. But again, this suggests that the level of plasma is important. Okay. This was another study that was conducted, that was published in 2011. And in this study, basically, the, the, the authors, what they, are, they were doing in, in pigs, where they, uh, they were uh, adding control without no plasma, very low level of plasma, 2.5% inclusion level of, five, of the recommended level of 5% during 14 days. And what they observed was that peak fifth five percent plasma have a reduction in the fecal score. The two and a half percent was not enough because uh, numerically it was better, but was not statistically better. But this reduction in the fecal score was because the pro -inf the inflammation and intestinal level. You can see the pro-inflammatory cytokines was reduced. And the barrier function of the intestinal mucosa was improved when you were feeding plasma at five percent inclusion level and not to the two two and a half percent. Obviously, you have a better barrier function, you have less inflammation at the intestinal level, you are expecting to have less diarrhea. And basically, was what we observed in this study. Why it is important that the animals at winning start uh, great. Why is so important that the animal start eating at winning? This was a very old study that was published in 1992, 1992. And basically what the study suggests is if during the first week at winning, the animals don't put any average daily gain, they don't put weight or they lose weight, the animals take 183 days to go to the market. But if the same animals during the first week of, uh, of winning, they put between zero to 150 grams of average daily gain, 
these animals have four days uh, less uh, four days to arrive to the days to the market and if the animal has a very great great uh, 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 starting at winning and these animals during the first week are able to put 227 grams or more uh, in average dairy gain these animals take 10 days less to go to to the market uh, it's very little amount of feed what the animals eat during the first week but these animals eat a lot at the end of the of the life before going to the market then it's always very very convenient to have a very uh, good starting at winning this was a study that uh, was published in 2016 and basically what we did was uh, we feed the animals at winning six percent plasma for 14 days and we follow the animals till the uh, till the till the slaughterhouse and um, basically uh, what for example in this parameter the mortality what we observed was feeding plasma during the nursery, per nursery period there was a clear reduction in mortality okay uh, almost three times less mortality with plasma and the question is but you keep this reduction in mortality till then yes till then we reduce the mortality by half not only the mortality in this study we were able to demonstrate that the animals that were fed with plasma they have uh, two and a half kilos more carcass body weight at the slaughter time compared with the control uh, pig, uh, control pigs this means the investment in the winning phase is really important till then in fact in this study we calculate the return of investment was than the uh, farmer half $13 more per pigs when they will uh, they, uh, in the group than were feed with plasma. Uh, even obviously uh, with this discount the cost of plasma in this in this $13. There are a lot of questions about the uh, uh, than plasma um, depending of the winning age uh, the plasma response is is going down. Uh, because there are a lot of uh, some people believe that when well, when you were using plasma 10 17 days of, of of winning plasma makes sense because the animals need to support the immune system but when we were feeding animal when we winning the winning the, the animals at 28 days uh, plasma is not needed. Well, this was a meta-analysis uh, conducted by David Torreyardona in 2010. Uh, there, there was different number of experiments in this category. And basically what he demonstrated is that compared with the control, uh, if you feed uh, plasma, doesn't matter what is the winning age category. Uh, plasma has a big effect when the animals were winning between 18 to for 24 days the improvement was almost 40 uh, uh, 14 grams improved 14 grams per day versus the control but even when you were uh, winning animals between 24 to 32 days you have 35 this means winning per se is a very stress, stressful step in the life of the animals and then under this stressing condition, plasma work. Doesn't matter if you are winning the animals at 21 days or you are winning the animals at 28 days. In fact, here in Europe, uh, that the winning age is, is going later, 28, 30, 32 days, uh, the use of plasma is quite common in, in, in most of the European countries. What about feeding plasma in challenge condition? Because plasma works, but Plasma, if, if, if you have a very clean environment, not stress, honestly, you are not going to see too much plasma effect. Uh, when you are going to see the plasma effect is under challenge conditions. There are a lot of publications. Uh, you can see it in this table, in pigs, in, uh, in calves, in, even in shrimp, in, in broilers. Uh, you can see that, that there is a multiple, uh, multiple publication that shows the animals feed plasma have less morbidity and mortality and recover more quickly to uh, different uh, types of bacterial or uh, viral disease. And the effect of plasma is consistent uh, across uh, 
different animal species, and uh, that's a matter if we were using bovine or porcine plasma. Basically, uh, these are studies that has been published in most of them in pigs with different challenges with E. coli, with salmonella, with rotavirus, even with LPS. Uh, and basically, what we observe in most of these studies is a consistent effect that plasma reduce diarrhea, improve the average daily gain, improve survival, and improve the feed efficiency. Talking about challenge conditions, this was a study that was published by the Iowa State University uh, by Duffy et al. in three years ago. And basically, what they did is they were uh, they have two diet, one diet with the control diet or a diet with bovine plasma. And on day one, on day seven, sorry, they started the, the animals with the diet on days uh, minus six. And then on day one, they challenged the animals with PDB. And basically what they observed when they analyzed the, the clearance of the virus in the feces was the animals that were fed with plasma have a faster clearance rate of the fecal PDB genome. In fact, as you can see here, after the 12 days of the inoculation, there was no virus in the feces in the group feed with plasma, but still there was virus in the feces of the animals in the control group. This means plasma helps to clear the rate of the fecal PDB genome. And we have said exactly the same in another study with peers, exactly the same data. The reason for that probably is this, was that the bovine plasma allowed the animals to induce a early antibody response and probably because these animals have an early antibody response to the PDB can explain why the animals clear the virus faster, okay? This was, an, talking about peers, uh, this was a study that was published uh, four years ago. Uh, we conducted a study in a commercial farm and then half received pigs from a peers positive uh, sow farm, this means these pigs were very weak. And basically we were testing 20 pens per feed programs and 24 pigs per pen, a lot of pigs. And uh, this is the, the program that the farm have. They have an uh, alternative program that uh, in the phase one, the first 14 days, they, ha they have peptons, poultry, uh, protein diets, yeast, and 10 different, uh, 10 different uh, additives flavor, acidifier, probiotics, uh, uh, prebiotics, probiotics, 10 different additives. In fact, the cost of this diet was quite expensive. We take out everything and just put 5% plasma. In fact, the diet with 5% plasma was cheaper than the, the program that they were using. Because these animals are weak, are coming from a sow uh, positive uh, peers farm, in the second uh, phase, for the second, uh, for the third week, uh, phase two, for 14, 21 days, the normal problem have pepton, soy concentrate, and sodium butyrate, and we just replace everything with two and a half percent plasma. And the last uh, four weeks was a common diet in both in both programs. Well, what we observe, first of all, the body weight in the in the in the animals that were fed with the plasma, uh, plasma in the feed, we observe basically uh, an improvement of uh, 800 grams heavier peaks at 48 days. Not only the animals were heavier, also we observed a reduction, a clear reduction in mortality. The reduction was by 40% reduction in mortality in the group of animal feed with plasma. In fact, during this uh, study, just for the first 48 day, we observed a uh, value that uh, the, the use of plasma after you take out the cost of plasma was improved by $2.40. Another stressing condition, mycotoxins. Okay, this was a study that was published in 2014. And basically we have uh, in phase one, there was no mycotoxin in the phase one diet because usually the phase one diets are very high quality diets and it's not common to have mycotoxin in the first diet. Then we not inoculate the mycotoxin in the first diet. And basically there was a control group 
with or without plasma, plasma was six percent. And we observed in this phase one a clear improve, improvement in the average daily gain. In phase two diets, we take out plasma in the second diet. Okay, phase two diets not contain plasma, but we have animals that have no mycotoxin in the diet for the second diet, or a group that have mycotoxin in the second diet. And the mycotoxin was a uh, corn that contain a flatoxin and fumonosin. And you can see here, here this is the effect of the mycotoxin. Compare the control control versus the control with mycotoxin. Have a clear reduction in average daily gain. Very clear reduction. Okay, but look what happened if the animals that were feed plasma in the first diet, not at the time of the mycotoxin. These animals were able to cope the, the stress better than the control. These animals means that they start very well with plasma and the effect of plasma is not losing when you take out plasma. You can see that these animals were able to, uh, to, to, to mitigate the negative effect of the mycotoxin. And in fact, it was not statistically different than the control. Then the question, what about bovine or porcine plasma? Uh, there are people that suggest porcine plasma is better than bovine plasma. Honestly, we have conducted a lot of different studies just to know if, if this is true, if bovine plasma is better than porcine plasma. I just show, show, uh, showing you one of the last studies that we conducted and we published five years ago. And basically what we observed was, doesn't matter if it's bovine or porcine plasma. If there is plasma in the diet, have a clear effect compared with the control diet, okay? Uh, you can see here there is almost 750 grams higher body weight at day 35. And these are two lot of, of bovine plasma, two different lot of bovine plasma and two different lot of porcine plasma from different manufacturing plants. Um, basically, we were not able to see difference in between bovine or porcine plasma. The only difference was that the feed conversion was a slightly better with bovine plasma than porcine plasma. Slightly better, the feed conversion. And now I'm going to talk about the use of plasma as a replacement for antibiotic growth promoter. Be careful, I'm talking about antibiotic growth promoter, not antibiotic, uh, the use of therapeutic uh, antibiotics. Uh, why uh, has been used the infit antimicrobial for years? Because when you were using uh, antimicrobials in the feed, there was a clear effect in the winning age, and there was a clear effect in reducing the feed conversion. This was the reason. But after that, what happened, as you know, is that the, the use of antimicrobial in the feed increase the resistance of bacteria to the different antibiotics and the risk for the humans to have a resistant bacteria. That is the uh, new problem that is coming for humans in the next, uh, probably in the next decade. Well, this was uh, all a study conducted in 2003 and the, the authors were looking to see what is the effect of plasma or zinc oxide versus the control in animals uh, very young animals, 10 days, that were challenged with E. coli, uh, enterotoxic E. coli. Well, basically what they observed was the fecal consistency was, was improved, either with the use of zinc oxide or plasma. Uh, the number of, the percentage of pigs that excrete uh, the E. coli in the feces after the challenge was significantly reduced with the use of plasma and zinc oxide. In fact, plasma was better than zinc oxide in this study. And the mortality was significantly reduced compared with the control with the use of plasma and zinc oxide. It was not statistically different between plasma and zinc oxide, but numerically you can see there was almost half in the case of plasma. As you know, zinc oxide uh, nowadays is going to be banned by the European Union for next year and also Canada. And um, because has been demonstrated that zinc oxide is increasing the bacterial resistance. And this study demonstrated that plasma can be used to replace zinc oxide. And this was another study that was conducted. We, we did not participate in this study in the Danish peak production. That basically suggests that 5% plasma can replace 
uh, high level of zinc oxide. Uh, there was not aesthetically different. And when you are putting both together, zinc oxide and plasma, even better. Okay. This data suggests that plasma was with or without antibiotics. In fact, in the meta analysis from David Reyardona, and I was commenting before, these are the different studies involved in, in, in the meta analysis. When you are putting antibiotics in the feed, plasma, even with antibiotics, this means that the mechanism of, us, of action is completely different than the antibiotics. Even with antibiotics in the diet, plasma improved the average daily gain by 36 uh, grams per day, the feed intake by 43 grams, and in this case, there was no difference in feed conversion. But when you don't use plus, uh, antibiotics in the feed, plasma also worked, ob obviously, because plasma can replace antibiotics, then the improvement was basically the same, but even improved the feed conversion. With that said, these are my conclusions. Plasma is a good alternative to antibiotic growth promoted in all the studies conducted. Plasma performed better than the control group for all periods and all parameters analyzed and has similar average daily gain feed intake to thin conversion when compared with antibiotic growth promoter. Then it's a consistent alternative to antibiotic growth promoter in pig feed. What is the effect of removing plasma? This is a summary of 24 different trials that was conducted in the United States. And compared with the positive control with plasma, what is the effect of taking out plasma in the diet? In average daily gain, there was a reduction in average 21%. From these 24 studies, there was a study that had only half the range was between 2.7 to 48.7 reduction in average daily gain. In average, it was 21. In feed intakes, the average was 14. And gain to feed was a reduction in 8.8. .8. This means when you are taking out, out plasma, consider this. Consider that you are going to uh, damage the performance in your farm. And finally, this is the recommendations. Usually, usually for all feeding programs, basically what we are recommending for 5% plasma in the fish diet for 14 days. If the farm has very high stress, a lot of pathogen, then you can consider to put plasma in the phase two diets at two and a half percent uh, per two and a half percent. And if the farm is half is, is almost catastrophic then there is a lot of disease, a lot of pathogens, then you can consider it even in phase three diets. Thank you for your time and I think I have two minutes over my, my time. Sorry about that. Thank you, Dr. Javier. So uh, please stay uh, with us here and then I will invite Dr. Sandra and Mr. Ramesh on. So uh, we are waiting for the rest uh, to be on. Can I invite the audience here to do another question online? So let's see. Okay, the question is why spray dry plasma is certified as safe feed ingredients. So single choice, please. <laughs> so thank you for the participation. One of the choice saying that raw material is collected in inspected abattoir under control, spray drying ATC throughout substance, post drying heat treatment and exchange holding period and all of the above. So this one, all right. So, okay, I'm going to close the question now. Dr. Javier, so. Well, the I question is very easy to answer. It's all above. All above, yeah, very good. So it's very nice to see the product from APC that um, uh, certify, follow the WHO standard, and also answer to the question on the safety side if uh, taking from the healthy pig, healthy bovine, and also uh, go through the heat process that that really safe. So right now come to the Q and A answer uh, Q and A session. So thank you, Dr. Sandra. You spent a lot of time in in answering the question. Anyway, I will pick it pick it up again to share with the audience here. Uh, I have a question, Dr. Sandra. So there is a lot of concern on vaccine for ASF. Do you have any idea on the success for the new uh, for the near future? I I typed quite a lot of text into the into the box, but I can cut it short. So, 
at the moment, I see the advent of quite a lot of promising vaccine candidates. But so far, most of them were mainly tested under experimental conditions where we have short-term experiments. So um, we do have at least a handful of candidates that are able to completely block uh, challenge infection. Um, the problem is that we already have bad experience from the past regarding the, um, the life attenuated vaccines. And in my hands, I have at the moment the same problem again. We have a very promising candidates from different uh, colleagues. And if you look into reversion to violence, so genetic stability, they give us a headache. So um, I have no idea how this stupid virus does it, but um, there is in the end increase in replication and violence in animal um, passaging. I would never have thought this could happen because this is a large deletion. So you would say, okay, this usually does not happen, but it happens. And um, there is the, for the risk assessment, it is not something that kills the virus or the, the vaccine, but you have to be very careful. And for me, it's at the moment, these hasty solutions more ha do more harm than um, they help. And especially what I would really implore, I, really, I would like to ask you, please um, do not go for illegal vaccines that are not tested um, thoroughly. The safety is the problem. It's not the, um, the problem that the, the, there, is at least, there is no virtue, but um, something that you put in the field, you will never get back if it has uh, disadvantages that you find out later. So please be careful, but I still, I'm quite convinced that we will have a vaccine, but uh, not tomorrow. Hmm. Yeah, thank you very much. And I think your answer definitely answer to about five questions on the Q&A already in general, because from Taiwan, from China, they're asking about like um, what you see on, on the problem side. So you, thank you very much for the clear answer. So my next question to Dr. Sandra again, is there any new knowledge on neutralizing antibody to protect this disease in pig? that might be survived after being infected? Um, the, the neutralizing antibodies are um, a point of discussion since decades. Uh, we know that for, in, in terms, when I, when I compare, for example, classical swine fever, and African swine fever, there is no neutralizing activity whatsoever. But if I, on a scientific uh, base, I try to find something, there is um, evidence that a certain neutralizing activity is present. What the, the main problem is that um, in the end, it is some kind of, the, the mixture of humoral immunity and cellular immunity does the trick. So um, the, when you look, for example, if you give an inactivated vaccine, the animal will show high antibody responses, but no protection, no protection whatsoever even um, some enhancement of clinical science. So this shows you that uh, looking for antibodies alone and Im immunogenicity um, is just too short. It will not help. So uh, what we have to do is we have to find a way to go for especially T cell responses that have proven to be uh, protective, but without antibodies, we can also not do do anything. I was also asked about the, um, the passive transfer of um, re uh, yeah, serum plasma from um, recovered animals. In the, in the past, in the, really in history, it has been tried. And um, if you really give it as a, a plasma constitution, more or less, um, then you get a partial protection. But this is, does not completely block uh, the virus, and this is not really a treatment option in the pig, uh, pig industry. And if you give it orally, it will not help. All right, um, Dr. Sander, thank you very much. I go next to Dr. Javier for a few questions. Dr. Javier, there is a question on the Q&A asking, uh, what is plasma means to AF, ASF? And how many percent or ratio of plasma can be used in pig's feed? 
Well, the, I, I start with the last question because basically is what the recommendation I put in my last slide was basically we are recommending four or five percent in the winning phase in the first two weeks of uh, at winning. Nevertheless, we have data. Uh, I'm not presenting today, but even with uh, growing finishing peaks to replace antibiotic at, uh, at that period. Eh? Um, but basically, the, the, the inclusion level is much lower. We are talking about 0.5% at that level. Okay, But the winning peaks, 4 or 5% is the right thing. What about African swine fever and plasma? This is a good question because we don't know exactly. Uh, we know that uh, we know that plasma has been uh, when we have been working with different uh, diseases, with peers, with circovirus, with PDB. Basically, what we observe is that plasma improve the improve not immune modulate the the immune system of the modulate the immune system of the animals. This is what we observe. We know that animals that, uh, have a problem with peers when we are feeding plasma. They perform better. Plasma will not avoid the disease, not at all. The disease, the animals will be infected uh, as, as the control, but what we observe is the animals perform better. Um, manage the disease to reduce the negative effect in some cases or the disease. We have this data in circovirus, we have this data in PDB, we have this data in peers, uh, for example. In African swine fever, last year we conducted a study in a biosafety free lab in Spain. And um, basically, we were feeding plasma in the control. Uh, we were feeding plasma versus the control diet without plasma. And we challenged the animals by contact with African swine fever. And what we observed was the animals that were fed with plasma have a delay in the symptoms, delayed in the temperature, in the increase in the, in the fever, a clear delay, statistically different, and have a reduced number of, uh, of uh, virus titel in different tissues of, uh, of the animal, in the key ones, okay, in the spleen and in the tonsils. We are going to publish this data. What this means, the animal at the end of the day were infected. We not avoid that. The plasma will not avoid the animals to be infected. But looks like then the animals modulate the immune system in a way that the animals, at least for the period of time of the study, we observed that the animals uh, cope better with the disease. In practical, what this may mean, honestly, we are now, we initiate next week a study with uh, official, well, will be official vaccine, hopefully, <laughs> at least with a pharmaceutical company in Europe, then they are developing a vaccine. And we want to see if plasma can help the vaccines to perform better. And also in a situation where you have a not very aggressive strain of African swine fever, maybe plasma can help in these specific con conditions. But again, we, it's, it's too early to know oh, how plasma can help. What we know is for others, this is very is a clear effect. So it's like the management well, nutrition well, and yes. provide a good health for the pig would, would need to integrate together. Right? Exactly. Thank you, doctor. So I would like to go back to Dr. Sandra. So this one, I know that you answer on the Q&A already, but I think this question come up with the pre uh, question as well. It is match. I think it's good to elaborate uh, to the audience here. Hi, doctor. If the PCR test comes out ASF positive, how do we check if that is a viable virus before allowing feed delivery? Or uh, I, I saw your answer already, but um, I would like you to explain more and recommend more because there are a lot of situations in ASEAN that People are in doubt if it's so show positive at the PCR, what next? That, that that should be the best practice they should implement, doctor. It's actually not a trivial question. The problem with the PCR positive result shows you that there at least was a virus at a certain point, if this is not a contamination. But I, I assume it is not a contamination, it's true um, positive then, of course, you can do virus isolation. 
it's a lab laborious and also time consuming issue and probably not done in the routine lab that you usually uh, send your samples to, but this is an option. The same is true for a bioassay, but this is of course nothing you would do routinely. Um, if you check that, then you can be rather sure that this is not infectious anymore. But um, it is a matter of risk assessment. If you have to live with the um, material that was PCR positive, then I would rather go for treatment um, and just then afterwards um, use it. It can, I, I, I just explained that I, it could, I could in, imagine that you use um, some organic acid to um, lower the pH. Then we know the virus or residual virus will be inactivated. We are currently testing it under experimental conditions because it has been asked by several um, yeah, countries and also uh, including Germany. Uh, storage, as I said, is, is one option. You have to keep in mind that if there was PCR positive result, there is a residual risk because uh, in the end, virus has been on this surface. And then it's also difficult if you um, sample large batch it's a problem of the, of the sample. If you, for example, resample, you may get a negative result. If you then resample, you may get a positive. So um, it is very difficult to do something like freedom from ASF in a huge batch of any metrics that you choose. So um, this, it, it is not, it's not so easy. If it would be my farm, uh, I would definitely um, try to get the result on, a, on an virus isolation. If this is not possible, I would do all mitigation strategies that I can think of. This would be storage that would probably be mixing with an organic um, acid. But this is, if this is uh, the solution for all applications, I doubt it because, yeah, it's just um, one of the options. I'm sorry. This is so it a bit depends complex. To the it, it depends on the application they are going to use from understanding from your presentation. If even your, your products, your feed, it's safe already, but you, you have like a little bit of, of active virus in that and it stay for the room temperature for the time that they can grow. It can be growing again, something that's, that's explained in... in in the end, the virus always needs a host. So the virus yes. will not um, be get more just on the matrix. So any virus whatsoever needs a living cell to replicate. So um, wh whatever you do, um, storage will always decrease the, the virus content. It can be different for, for bacteria, but it's for the virus. It will always go down. So yeah. um, it can only be something that was already in that is then um, going into the pig and replicating there. So uh, come to the question, it into the real story that I, I myself faced it since 2019 that we have ASF like big time in Philippines, in Vietnam. And this question I may ask Dr. Javier and Mr. Ramesh as well. That is a uh, for certain time, they are thinking about, oh, if the products like plasma on the porcine from pig, the regulatory, the, the regulator at the port will say that anything from pig, stop, no import into the country. So I would like to ask the idea from Dr. Sandra, Dr. Javier, and Mr. Ramesh. APC has very good product. Uh, uh, certified and safe, but in terms of the psychology saying that anything from pig import in my country can induce and introduce the ASF into the country. So Dr. Sandra, from the research perspective, and you give the consultant to, to many countries, I would say, how uh, we should implement the prevention Just a suggestion for. Do you mean in terms of the um, importation? Animal... Yes, a animal byproducts. Yeah. I mean, you you really have to look into the um, records of the of the companies and the the producers. If the producer can guarantee that they adhered to, for example, the EU uh, legislation, I do not see a risk. 
because then you you know the um, the animals were healthy. Just imagine an animal looking healthy went to the slaughterhouse. Um, it will only contain residual virus, very low contents. If you then go through the process of manufacturing, I'm really sure that the residual virus is gone. Of course, you always have to make sure that you also look for recontamination. This is not the business of the, of the producer anymore. You always also have to look at your end. But um, if this is guaranteed, I don't see a problem. The main problem is you already mentioned psychology. Um, you know that in some Asian countries, um, blood products are also used other other ways. It, they, you just um, more or less collect it at the slaughterhouse. You know that a lot of infected animals were going to the slaughterhouse and then blood is spreading the virus like hell. So you really have to dis discriminate the, the well-manufactured uh, blood or byproducts uh, of any kind and something that is rather less controlled and where, especially where you know that animals go to the slaughterhouse that may not be negative um, please keep your hands off the product. All right, doctor, thank you very much. That would be the, the um, guide for the importer also to, to recheck like container when they ship things and also even their storage. It has to be really zero virus and no host to be in the storage. Uh, back to Mr. Javier. So yes. if you... You are working in R&D, and if you can recommend the buyers of the feed additives, what you will recommend them to check on in order to make sure that the animal byproduct they buy in would be safe from ASF? Well, basically, I agree with uh, Sandra. You need to, to know the manufacturer of the animal byproduct, have a reliable source of, of the product. Uh, Production in, in Europe is, is very, very regulated by the European Commission. It's very strict. You cannot collect blood from, from sick animals. All the blood is coming from healthy animals. In the case of our uh, plants in, in ABC, we are in a free area of African and fever, but it doesn't matter because the, the control of the European Commission and the regulation is very strict and there is no risk of collecting blood from Africa to fever uh, sick animal. There is no risk, no risk at, at all. The same happened with the United States, obviously. Okay. The first of all, reliable uh, source of supplier. And secondly, remember that the European Food Safety Authority, uh, the EFSA, in the risk analysis, they put blood product even le lower risk than vegetable proteins. This means compared with vegetable proteins in the risk analysis, plasma score lower. Okay, then I think it's more psychological question because the virus is affecting the pigs and blood is uh, is the tissue where the virus replicate. But this is more psychological than the reality. The reality is that probably there is more risk in harvesting uh, cereals than just using porcine plasma from the United States or from, from Europe. All right, so I come to the last one, Mr. Ramesh, anything to give to the audience on uh, strengthen the uh, quality and the safety of um, APC's products? Uh, yeah, Ms. Rose, I think uh, the whole idea of this kind of webinars is to educate the industry, you know, so to clarify some of the consumptions they have, you know, clarify that and bring experts and bring the right perspective. So we bring in products from non-ASF countries into Asia. And uh, so uh, we have complete traceability and, uh, you know, and uh, we believe that uh, uh, the plasma that we supply is a safe product. So, so that is the assurance that we can give. All right, so it's time for us. I would like to thank you to APC Group and especially to Dr. Sandra Broom from her very busy time to be at this webinar with APC. And to the audience, please follow the APC, the ASF Expert Series. 
they will uh, promote in the QR code that Mr. Ramesh gave earlier, we will show after my closing session. So on behalf of Informa Markets and APC, I would like to thank you for our audience and please feel free to join our survey for improve and bring more knowledge to the market to you all. Thank you very much. สวัสดีค่ะ